Did you ever take a long, long trip away from home? Some place where the license plates aren't all green? <laughs> Suzanne and I drove down to visit her family in Florida one time, and uh, you know, we, we, drove, we drove with our green license plate all the way. I saw one other Vermonter in a state park parked in front of us when we pulled in. It was the only other green tag I saw from the Vermont border at, with New York all the way to Florida, all the way back. When we met these people, of course, because they were the only Vermonters we had met in this entire 3,000 mile trip, we asked them where they were from and they said St. Albans. So go <laughs> figure. <laughs> but uh, a couple of years ago, Suzanne and I took a trip out for her brother's wedding out to the West Coast, out to Washington State. And uh, while we were there, we had a chance, we spent, oh, probably a better part of two weeks. We got to admire the big trees. We took a trip along the Columbia River. We went to see Mount St. Helens. We saw the Cascades. We really drove around a lot, had a great time with family, met lots of people from the other side of the country and so on. And then when it was all over, we boarded our plane to come home. And again, looking out the window, got to see lots of things that you never see around Vermont more mountains and more mountains and more mountains and the Great Plains stretching out for as far as you can see the Mississippi River and so on but then at some point even looking out the window from whatever it is five six seven miles up things started to look a little bit more familiar after a while you start to notice more trees and certainly no more craggy mountains uh, the towns are a little bit more bunched together the way they are around here and finally at some point we could see the wooded summits of the Green Mountains of course if you've flown into Burlington it's pretty much the same thing every time you're coming along if you're coming up from New York Newark or Philly you see Route 7 you could, maybe on one side of the plane the other side you see Lake Champlain you pick out Shelburne the plane makes the big turn over Hinesburg Williston it's coming down now you can see the places where you shop and you can see the intersections where you wait for the light and you can practically see your neighbor's cars lined up and, and as the plane is coming down if you look off to the north you can see a hill with a little white dome on top of it and you know you're home you know that you're back funny feeling all of a sudden all the strange and wonderful sights of the past weeks begin to fade away and you feel yourself already picking up the routine of life even while you're sort of rummaging around for your stuff in the plane. You're home. In a few hours, you'll be back in your front yard. You'll be pulling your suitcase up the steps. You'll dig into that monstrous pile of mail. You'll get up the courage to go after the answering machine and listen to all of the calls that came in while you were gone. You're back home. And all of a sudden, the familiar things gather around you and you start to to look at the next things that are on your plate and the, the next tasks. They're familiar. They're the things that you left behind maybe for a little bit, but now you're back and doing your life. This feeling of somehow being on familiar territory, of just looking out the window, as it were, and saying, this just feels like where I live and where I belong, is exactly what we encounter when we open the fifth book of the New Testament. It's called the Acts of the Apostles. When you read the Old Testament, it's like taking a journey into an ancient and very foreign world. How many of you have been reading in some part of the Old Testament and either said, I have no idea what they're talking about, or I could never read this to my kids, or whatever the case might be. It's a world of warring tribes, of pharaohs and other despots, emperors and armies, peoples and nations with funny-sounding names, a world where people worship with temples and all sorts of sacrifices, it's a story in which we encounter God beginning to tell us the story of himself and the world that he created. But it's a very distant world. If you want to think of this in terms of five acts, like a play, act one, the very beginning of the Old Testament, shows us God creating a good world and placing people in it as his reflection. Act two follows all too quickly. And it shows us how the people he placed in charge of his world turned against him, thus unleashing the problems and the evil that we all struggle with to this day. Act 3 tells us how the Creator set in motion a rescue mission by establishing a solemn covenant with a wandering sheik 
named Abraham. It tells how this man's family became a clan and eventually it became a tribal federation. It tells how God rescued them from slavery in Egypt and settled them in their own land. It tells how again and again they failed to live up to their end of the covenant and eventually ended up in exile. So now we're at the end of the Old Testament. We've done Act 1 and Act 2 and Act 3. And now we come to Act 4. That's the act about Jesus. The New Testament begins with this Act 4. We took a lot of time last December to talk about that as we prepared our hearts for Christmas. And Act 4 goes from the Christmas story to the Easter story, the time that we've just finished uh, in our calendar year. It's the story of God making a new covenant with you and me. The long years of exile and darkness give way to the light of the world, Jesus, God's Son. And we see that this, it's this Jesus who proclaims a brand new exodus, a journey that he himself takes for you and me, going through death to bring a brand new life. He brings together heaven and earth the way his prayer said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then when Jesus has finished his work, the story takes a turn toward a world that begins to feel like the one we know. Act 5, welcome to our world. And it's for that reason that I want to take a few weeks with you to talk about what it means to say, welcome to our world. Because as you open your Bible, from anywhere from about Acts chapter 2, right on through to the end, you are reading words that are written to people in exactly the same spiritual situation that you and I experience. Act 5 begins with the startling reality that Jesus is alive. God's new creation has begun. Act 5 is the story of God's new creation. Paul sums it up this way in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone the new is here. And this new world, this new creation, is somehow our world. When you read these parts of the Bible, you meet people who, like us, have put their faith and their trust in Jesus. We discover that God now makes himself present, not in a temple, not in a system of sacrifices and so on, but through his Holy Spirit. For the first time, God's offer of forgiveness and his offer of new life is extended without any reservations to everybody on the planet regardless of their race, regardless of their social status, regardless of their gender, everybody's in if they want to be. <clears throat> no longer does the story center on a single place, a holy land or a holy city. It's become a story for every nook and cranny where people can be found, all the way to what the Bible calls the ends of the earth. God has done what only God could do to rescue and restore his spoiled creation. And now he's sending people out, beginning in Acts chapter 2 and right up to this moment with you and me, sending us out to be his agents in this world, to bring his new creation into people's situations and into people's lives, everything that we touch. This is our world. This is the world that, that we know and that they knew. And if, if we could sit down with the people that we read about in the book of Acts, whether it be Peter or Paul or maybe some nameless person in the church in Jerusalem, we would find that we would have more in common with them than with people anywhere else in the Bible story because their world is our world. So this world that we enter into when we read the Acts of the Apostles should be very familiar to us. But I just wonder how strange and forbidding it must have been to Jesus' followers who stepped into that world not even realizing that that's what they were doing. Everything we take for granted in our relationship with God meant a radical departure from the world that they knew. Think about, first of all, they were in a world where Jesus was their greatest reality. And in chapter 1 of the book of Acts, guess what happens to Jesus? He leaves. And they are now here with his spirit but Jesus is no longer physically walking alongside of them. I doubt they ever factored that in when they saw Jesus come back from the dead. They must have thought, hey, the story's over. Now we just live happily ever after. And instead, Jesus said, I'm going to send you out, but I won't even be here. God would no longer dwell in the temple. The greatest physical reality of their world as Jewish people was this monumental structure called the temple. 
It was considered the holiest place on the planet, the place where God chose to invisibly dwell. If you wanted to get close to God, if you wanted to worship, if you wanted your prayers to be heard, that's where you went. I was watching a documentary just yesterday um, about the city of Jerusalem and they have recently found old streets that now they call it a tunnel but in the, in the old days it was the open air. It was a street that runs along the western side of the temple. And as you know, Jewish people can't go up to where the temple actually stood. But now they can go, because of the opening of this temple, to a gate. It's all closed up, but it was the gate that went right to the temple building itself. And the archaeologist was explaining, people like to pray here because this is the closest place they can get to that holy, holiest place where God's temple stood. Well, now we're in a world in the book of Acts where that no longer applies. For people who'd lived their whole lives, their ancestors had lived their whole lives, always thinking in terms of God is right here, now God says, I'm going to be right here, right inside of you. Talk about a, a strange journey. For them, the exodus had always been a journey from a pagan, hostile world into this holy place where God would rule. And now God is going to say to them, I'm putting you on a new journey. And your journey is going to take you from the holy city out into the world. It's a reverse exodus. In short, their world was going to be turned upside down. The things that we take for granted, like having church in St. Albans, Vermont, would have been utterly strange to them, foreign to them, uh, even in some cases uh, abomin an abomination to them. What? A bunch of Gentiles? In a faraway place? who will never come to the temple, and that's the world that we live in. Perhaps by looking at our world through their eyes and through their experiences, we can better understand just how wonderful God's work of new creation is. You know, just as you have visitors come, perhaps this summer someone will come and come from some other part of the country where they don't have green license plates, and will come spend a few days with you and you'll take them around. Did you ever have that experience? And you, they get all excited about seeing the sugar house or, or going to Ben and Jerry's or whatever the thing is that you do. It's something you take for granted and you go, wow, yeah, that really is good. I, I'd forgotten. I just started to take it for granted. Well, I wonder if when we go back and join these new arrivals in God's new world, the world that we live in, we might begin to see some of the things that we've taken for granted in a new light. So what was it that these disciples discovered as they found themselves on the verge of entering this whole new world of God's new creation? What would they need to know and what did they need to know about themselves? What would they be called to do? Well, the first thing they needed to know was that they were actually stepping into a radically new reality. Maybe you experienced that or can remember that when you first became aware of who Jesus is and you decided to give your life to him and the world started to look differently to you. You see, if you had been one of those disciples and someone said, this is God's new creation, you would, not have, you would have probably looked at that person and said, where? What's changed? Now think about it. The world hadn't come to an end. God had not come down and defeated his enemies. The Pilate who put Jesus on a cross was still the governor. Caiaphas, the high priest who had framed Jesus and arranged the show trial to get him to Pilate, was still the high priest. In short, nothing had changed. And yet, in another sense, everything had changed because Jesus had come back from the dead. When Luke talks to us in Acts chapter 1 about this new world that we now inhabit, he begins by anchoring his story in the reality that one thing did change and that one thing changed everything else. Look with me at Acts chapter 1 verse 3. And this is where Luke is sort of getting us started as he begins to t his story of this Act 5 that we live in. After his suffering, he, Jesus, presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. There's one word I want to single out to you there, the word proofs, because Luke was a very careful writer, a very educated writer. He was writing a very um, serious sort of document to a wealthy person, his patron, Theophilus, 
And this was meant to be read. Uh, this was not just sort of like writing a quick newspaper article. He was writing a very thoughtful, and, and he meant to make it a very thorough story of Jesus and of the coming of the Spirit of God. And so he uses a technical term for proof, which means a proof positive or a necessary proof. If this is so, then there can be no question that what we're talking about is true. And so he says Jesus proved that he was alive. Proved it beyond the shadow of a doubt for anyone who was there to see the proof. We can look back in Luke 24, which is certainly in Luke's mind, to get a little picture of what that proof must have looked like on Easter night, Luke 24, verses 36 to 43, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself self stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your minds? Now here comes some of the proofs. Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. We know from the Gospel of John that the scars of the nails were there to be seen on Jesus' hands and feet, as well as the scar of the spear in his side. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and, and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Now, the disciples were all too familiar with death and with loss. They understood death. They knew what it meant to be dead. They knew all of the signs of death. They were not naive people. Many Jewish people of that day believed that the dead could live on in a spiritual sense as spirits, or even they would use the word angel to refer to the spirit of a person that had gone on uh, after death. And they certainly would have been open to the idea that a person might have a vision uh, or an experience in which they felt like that lost one, loved one had come back to them. I know I've talked to people all the time who seem to have that same experience, very comforting to have that sense of, of, of connection, not necessarily something they chose, but maybe in a dream or something. The disciples would have understood that. But there was no place in their world for a person who was truly dead to come back to life and be back to life permanently. There was absolutely no expectation of that. Jesus is confronting them with a mind-boggling new reality for which they had no grid whatsoever. This was the thing being raised from the dead with a body that could never die that they believed God would do for the right, righteous people, the good people, at the end of time when he brought his kingdom. There was never an expectation that one person would be raised. There was never any expectation that the Messiah would die and be raised. This was not in their book. This was not in Act 4 or 3 or 2 or 1. They had no grid for that. So if God were to raise someone from the dead permanently, that would mean the new creation had started, but had started in a way nobody expected. Imagine all the ideas and memories that would need to be reconnected in a new way if Jesus were truly raised from the dead. That morning, Easter morning, they thought Jesus was dead and gone. Now he's standing in front of them, proving to them that he's physically alive. That morning, they thought God's kingdom would never come in their lifetimes. Now they're seeing the kingdom in person, the person of the great king. For the next 40 days, Jesus would try to help them connect the dots and begin to learn how to live and think in a brand new world. Little did they know it, but in order to live and work in the new world of God's new creation, they would have to become a new people. They couldn't just be the people they were before. They couldn't just sort of add on to their life story that they had a, a great moment when they saw Jesus come back from the dead and they just kept doing their normal thing. Becoming a new people will be their first assignment. Now you think back to the original Exodus story. God took his people, they were slaves, took them out of Egypt and took them on a journey to the promised land. What's the first thing God had to do with them? Well, the first thing he had to do was formed them into a new people with a new vision of themselves, a new identity. Because even though they were physically in a different place, and even though Pharaoh and his, his oppressive uh, leaders were not there to tell them what to do, if you went inside their heads, they were still thinking like 
inhabitants of Egypt who were slaves. And it took 40 years of travel through the desert for God to create a whole new mindset, a whole new people. Now the same thing is happening with these disciples. They're on the beginning of a brand new journey. And the first thing they need to do is become a new people. You know, you and I face the same challenge. When we accept Jesus as our Savior, when we accept His forgiveness, when we understand that we're going to leave the old behind, the first thing that has to happen is that we have to come to see ourselves in a totally different way. Paul says that when we're part of God's new creation, we're part of God's new kingdom. We have a new citizenship. Listen to how he puts it in Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. He's talking about a kingdom. He's talking about a realm in which you would be enslaved. He's rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now for that to happen, something has to change inside you and me. And Jesus explained that it meant being newly created. Jesus was newly created when he came out of the tomb and was alive. Well, what is it going to take for you or for me to go from this old dark kingdom into the new kingdom? Listen to how Jesus put it in John chapter 3. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God, God's new creation, unless they're born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. We use that term born again. Uh, we use it perhaps somewhat, um, I don't know, casually to sort of describe a moment perhaps when we said a prayer or, or whatever. But how big of a deal is this? This is the equivalent of Jesus rising from the dead and being part of God's new creation. And now you and I, like these early disciples, are being birthed by the Spirit of God to be part of God's new creation, a whole new people. In fact, when we go back to Acts chapter 1, as Jesus was explaining to these disciples that they were in a new time, listen to what he says in verses 4 and 5. On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised which you've heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You see, just as God's Spirit went into that tomb where Jesus lay dead for three days and breathed God's new life into him and recreated him to live physically forevermore, in the same way the Spirit of God comes and breathes new life into you and to me. Make us, part, make us God's new people. The first thing God does with us, and he never stops working on it, is to take us and to make us into a new people. And when we use the word people, we're not saying new person. Yes, each one of us is a new person in Christ, but none of us stands alone. God is joining us together as his people, as a group, a community of people. It might be a small group that gets to know each other very well. It might be a large group like a church but we're part of something bigger that God is doing. Now the Exodus journey into this new creation that God has, has unleashed through Jesus is a journey that has a purpose. If you think about the first Exodus, it was a journey from slavery to a land flowing with milk and honey. They weren't just going out to walk around in the desert. They weren't just going out to sort of hide from Pharaoh and live in poverty as a group of shepherds. Instead, they were going to fulfill a great mission that God had. And so I think that there's, it's understandable why the disciples, when they start to get a little glimpse of this new thing God is doing, is they ask a mission-oriented question. Verse, five, verse 6 says, Then they gathered around Jesus and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They could see where this was all leading. God was doing this new thing. Jesus was alive now so the new reality the new kingdom had started the new creation had started well now this must be the end this must be fixing it all think of the excitement for them this is at long last the end of the journey arrival at the promised land the exodus is finally over we've been through the dark night of Calvary and we've been through the many 
um, weeks and months leading up to that point and Jesus has come from the tomb and now the kingdom is here so imagine their confusion when Jesus answers not with a no but with a totally different mission it's sort of like him saying you're on the right track but you're you, know, you have the right idea but how is this going to work is going to be very different from what you're thinking we look at verses 7 and 8 and here we're going to find not only their mission but your mission and my mission he said to them it's not for you to know the times or dates the father is set by his own authority but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem Judea Samaria that those are places that are moving out from Jerusalem and to the ends of the earth you see what Jesus is describing here he is saying guys this isn't the end of the journey we haven't arrived we're here at the beginning of a journey everything that you were thinking was bringing us to the end of everything that God was doing is actually setting us up for the most important part of all heading out from this little place called Jerusalem and this little land called Judea or Israel and going out to places that no one's ever heard of yet it's a journey that takes you out to places that you would think of as being places of darkness and exile back out to the hated Samaritans and out to the pagan empire of Rome I think of it as Exodus turned inside out after all those hundreds and even thousands of years of thinking of Exodus always as we're going to the promised land we're going to the promised land we're going to the promised land now all of a sudden God says the promised land is now the whole wide world you're going out you're going out you're going out he goes on to say to the disciples that they themselves are going to announce the new reality God's not going to go out there and do all of that with angels coming down from heaven He's going to use ordinary people he's going to empower them with his Holy Spirit the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus that's why it's so important that they wait for that power and everywhere they go in the big wide world their exodus journey takes them they will tell the story of the king who came and conquered death himself they will tell the Creator God who kept his promise to reclaim his world they will offer forgiveness to the whole human family from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth in Act 5, the beginning of which we see in the book of Acts, and which we are living in right now, in Act 5, we have the incredible privilege of applying everything God has done to every situation in our world. Do you realize there's not one more thing that God has to do? Not one more sacrifice. Not one more Calvary not one more waiting for a gift from, the, from God that he would send that will allow his rescue plan to operate everything has been set in place we live in that time when a little band could go out and could evangelize a Roman Empire and a Roman Empire could eventually even when it collapsed could become the seedbed of Christianity going out throughout Europe and then into Africa and Asia in the assemblies of God alone right now there are over 65 million of us all around the world worshiping this morning and that doesn't count the people in China because we can't count the people in China there are perhaps a hundred million Pentecostal people spirit-filled people in China a tenth of the population but you can't go count them because most of them are meeting at home or in some other location to have church today ends of the earth those, those 11 Jewish men thinking about how it would all happen <laughs> could never have imagined something bigger than the United Nations something bigger than any empire that has ever been created something so big that you talk in terms of billions of people that belong to God's family a reversal of the exodus God's new life going out into a new world requires two things you see a new people and a new mission you can't do the new mission unless you are thinking differently and seeing yourself differently unless you're a new people what we're gonna see in the book of Acts over a few weeks now is that first of all God takes ordinary people like you and me and he creates them to be a new people filled with his spirit and then he sends them out to do their work welcome to our world when you see these 11 disciples see yourself 
When you see them gather in an upper room and you read that, the, that they were there and the women were there, find yourself in that crowd. Their story is our story. Like these first disciples, you and I are called to be God's new people and we've got to learn what that means. That's our starting point. And I think even for those of us who identified ourselves as Christians for many years, it doesn't hurt to stop and take inventory and say, am I really identifying myself with God's new people? Or am I just sort of caught up in the grind of daily life? Think about these things that tell us we are part of God's new people. Number one, God's new people. And ask yourself, is this true for me? Because this is part of your, where you're at with God. Number one, God's new people embrace the new reality of God conquering death through Jesus. God's new people know that God conquered death through Jesus. Paul could put it so, so succinctly that we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. If we do that, we're part of God's new people. Everything hangs on that reality. It is not an accident that Luke starts the book of Acts with the resurrection. It's not an accident that in every sermon, the key point that changes everything is that Jesus rose from the dead. So ask yourself, is that a reality for me? If it isn't, be honest about it and begin to ask God to show you where to go with that. Number two, God's new people welcome God's spirit to come and give them God's new life. God freely gives His Spirit, but we also choose to welcome His Spirit. And I want to encourage all of you ladies who are going on the retreat this weekend, that as you go and as you have extra special time alone, hopefully without interruption, this can be a time for God to be refreshing you in His Spirit. But understand what that means. That means becoming God's new people with the resurrection life of Jesus. It's not just about gaining some ability or gaining a spiritual gift as wonderful as those are those are all part of this bigger thing God is doing number three God's new people know themselves to be forgiven of the past and accepted as God's own children and number four God's people have a story to tell we're witnesses we go out we don't have to go out and argue with people we don't have to prove that God exists or that the Bible is true or whatever we go out and tell our story I once was lost and now I'm found the same Jesus who rose from the dead came and raised me from spiritual death and finally God's new people share that story with any and everyone in God's humanity as we have the opportunity sometimes with words, sometimes with actions. That's going to be our mission. So as we begin this, this focus on what it means to be in Act 5 of God's great rescue mission, again, let me just ask you, and I'd ask the band to come up at this time, do you see yourself as part of God's new people? Is that something you have consciously chosen as your own identity? Has God called you into his family? If not, if we could just bow our heads together, as the band gathers here just a couple of simple questions that I'll repeat to you have you come to that place where you can dare to believe that Jesus did really conquer death that God is doing a new thing in this world something you don't want to miss out on Would you be willing to welcome His Holy Spirit to come and in some mysterious way live inside of you, interacting with you in your mind, in your emotions, your will, never violating your free will, your ability to make choices, but loving you and transforming you, helping you find the courage to, to go forward as part of God's new work. Do you know yourself to be forgiven? You're willing to say, God, forgive me. Forgive me for the things I've done wrong. As we learned in that beautiful prayer that Jesus taught us, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. To be part of God's new people is something Jesus gave his life so that it could happen in our lives. But we make the final choice to step out with him become part of God's rescue plan
Father, I pray that you would help us as we, we look at ourselves and we look at what it is that we think and what we believe and what we feel. We look at the circumstances in our world around us, surrounded by a broken world, by that old marred creation. We see it playing out, the tragedy of a young man's life taken over the weekend. We see it in the tragedy of nations being torn apart, of a, a land like Syria locked in civil war. The things that we prayed about last week, the chaos in Boston and other parts of our, of our society. But Lord, you're calling us to look to you and to see that you have equipped us, if we will become your children, to be part of the remaking of your world. One person, one relationship at a time, one family at a time, one set of circumstances at a time. Lord, I thank you that you didn't give up on our world, as broken as it was and is. I thank you, Lord, that Act 5 in your great drama is the drama of you coming, raising Jesus from the dead promising to raise us all at the end of this story and in the meantime, turning us loose with your love and your power. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for being welcome in our world. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Let's stand together.